everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dark Crossroads. This is your host, Roxanne Fletcher, and today we're going to be covering a true crime case that is also an unsolved case, but is also a very old-timey case. I don't think many people have heard of this. Um, I was researching a different case and I stumbled upon this one and knew that I had to cover it. I found it so interesting, um, but with that said, let's just jump right in. My sources for today mostly come from an A&E true crime blog that covered a story of this case, also a website called Legends of America, and Slate.com. A group known as the Bender Family once ran a roadside inn in Kansas. When questions began to arise regarding the Bender's connection to missing people around the area, they ended up fleeing the state. Authorities ultimately accused the Benders of committing 11 murders between 1870 and 1873. The four of them were never caught, and what happened to them remains a mystery to this day. In the 19th century, Kansas was a bloody place, especially before the Civil War, as people were fighting for control of the new territory. Once Kansas declared itself with the Union and the Civil War began, the bloody battles continued. When the war was over, pioneers began to head westward along the many trails through Kansas. Murder and mayhem persisted as hardened men from the battlefields, grown used to the violence, continued their violent ways along the overland trails in the many cow towns. If not accosted by road agents, travelers also had to be concerned about Indian attacks. Southeast Kansas, in particular, was known as one of the rougher areas. Though most of us know a little history of the history of this area, few people are aware of a particular family of mass murderers living a supposed quiet life near the small town of Cherryvale. Just after the Civil War ended, the United States government moved the Native Americans from this area in Kansas to what was called at the time the New Indian Territory in what would later become the state of Oklahoma. Then, the vacated land that was in Kansas was made available to homesteaders, who, for the most part, were a group of hard-working pioneers farming the area's softly rolling hills and prairies. In 1870, five particular families of spiritualists settled in western Labatt County, about seven miles northeast of where Cherryvale would be created a year later. One of these families was the Benders, comprised of John Bender Sr., his wife Elmira, son John Jr., and daughter Kate. A cult-like group, the families chose from several available claims and began to make their homes. John Bender Sr. chose a 160-acre section of the western slopes of the mounds that continue to bear their name today. The property was located directly on the Asagi Mission Independence Trail that operated from Independence to Fort Scott. His son chose a narrow piece of land just north of his father's. However, he never lived on this claim nor made any improvements to it. The family soon built a small room, framed cabin, a barn, a corral, and dug a well. Inside the wooden cabin, the area was partitioned with a large canvas, creating living quarters in the back and a small inn and store in the front. A crude sign was hung above the front door that advertised groceries to the many travelers along the Asagi Trail. The little store carried a few supplies such as powder, groceries, liquor, tobacco, and they also made and sold meals and provided a safe place overnight for strangers that were traveling along the road. Keeping mostly to themselves, the Benders appeared to simply be struggling homesteaders who worked hard to earn their living like the other area pioneers. Immigrating from Germany, John Bender Sr., who was 60 years old when he arrived in the area, and his wife was about 55. Standing over six feet tall, John was a giant of a man who, because of his piercing black eyes set deeply under huge bushy brows, earned him the nickname of Old Beetle Browed John. His ruddy face, mostly covered by a heavy beard, sullen expression, and long hair often led him being described as a wild and wooly-looking man. 
John and his wife spoke with such guttural accents that few people could understand them in the area. Mrs. Bender was described as a heavy-set woman and was so unfriendly and had such sinister eyes that her neighbors began to call her a she-devil. To add to her fierce look, Ma Bender claimed to be a medium who could speak with the dead and boiled herbs and roots that she declared could be used to cast charms or wicked spells. Her husband and son were said to have feared her as she ran the household with an iron hand. John Bender Jr. was a tall, slender man of about 25 who was handsome with auburn hair and a mustache. Speaking English fluently with a German accent, he was said to have been social, but he was prone to laughing aimlessly, which led many people to think of him as a half-wit. Daughter Kate was the friendliest of the bunch, speaking good English with just a slight accent and had good social skills. She was a beautiful girl of about 23 years old. She was quick to laugh and talk to strangers. She and her brother John often attended Sunday school nearby Harmony Grove and were readily accepted in the community. Kate was a self-proclaimed healer and psychic, gave lectures on spiritualism, and conducted seances. She also claimed to possess psychic powers, including communicating with the dead. She soon found the lecture circuit profitable by distributing circulars that proclaimed her skills, including supernatural powers and the ability to cure illnesses and infirmities. She was petite and auburn hair and was a beautiful girl of the time. She desired notoriety and often advocated free love and justification for murder in her lectures. Along with her desire for fame, she also craved wealth and position. Though her beauty and social skills gained popularity with the locals, her actions began to cause them to say she was satanic. It was this Bender family member that would take most of the blame for what was soon to be found out about the infamous family. When the Benders opened their store in N in 1871, many travelers would stop for a meal or for supplies. However, some of those men who frequently carried large sums of cash with the intention of settling, buying stock, or purchasing a claim, began to go missing. When friends and family began to look for them, they could trace them as far as the big hill country of southeast Kansas before finding no trace of the lost traveler. These first few missing travelers did not raise any overall alarm in the area as it was not uncommon for men to continue their journey westward during these days. However, as more time passed, the disappearances became more frequent, and by the spring of 1873, the region had become strife with rumors and travelers began to avoid this trail. When neighboring communities started to make slanderous insinuations, the town called a meeting held at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse in March to see what, if anything, could be done. About 75 people attended this gathering, including both Bender men. The discussion began regarding the 10 people who were reported missing, including a well-known independence physician named Dr. William H. York. With the full realization that there was a major problem in their township, the group decided to search every farmstead between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek. The benders remained silent when most of the attendees volunteered to have their premises searched. Some time later, a man named Billy Toll, a neighbor of the benders, noticed that the Bender Inn was abandoned and their fa farm animals were unfed. Toll reported the news to Leroy F. Dick, the township trustee, and a search party was soon formed which included Dr. York's brother, Colonel York, of Fort Scott. When the men arrived at the property, they found the cabin empty of food, clothing, and personal possessions. A terrible smell inside the abandoned inn also met them. A trap door found nailed shut was discovered on the cabin floor. Prying the door open, the men found a six-foot-deep hole filled with clotted blood, causing a terrible odor. However, there were no bodies in this hole, and finally the men physically moved the entire cabin to the side and began to search beneath. But they found no bodies and continued to begin to dig around the cabin, especially in an area the benders had utilized as a vegetable garden and an orchard. At this site, a freshly stirred depression was in the earth, 
they found the first body here, buried head downward with its feet scarcely covered. The corpse was that of Dr. William H. York, his skull bludgeoned and his throat cut from ear to ear. The digging continued the next day, and nine other bodies and numerous dismembered body parts were found, including a woman and a little girl. The burial site was named Hell's Half Acre, and another brother of Dr. York, a lawyer and state senator residing in Independence, offered a $1,000 reward for any information leading to the Bender family's arrests, which this was around the 1870s, so in today's money, this would be around $23,335. On May 17th, Governor Thomas Osborne added to this amount by offering a $2,000 reward for the apprehension of all four benders, which in today's money would be around $46,670. Word of the gruesome murders spread fast, and thousands of people flocked to the site, including news reporters from as far away as New York and Chicago. The Bender cabin was ripped apart by gruesome souvenir hunters right down to the bloody bricks that lined the cellar. Bit by bit, the story of the Benders was pieced together. The Benders were not what they appeared. They weren't even a true family. The only ones that were actually related were Ma and Kate Bender. So the story goes that when visitors stopped for a meal, they were seated at a table with their backs to the large canvas that was separating the inn from the living quarters. Then, Kate would begin to charm the men with her social skills, her flirting, or revealing her psychic gifts. As the men gave their full attention to the alluring Kate, Pa and John Bender, hiding behind the canvas, would strike the unsuspecting traveler in the skull with a hammer. Ma Bender and Kate would then rifle the body for money, pushing him through the trap door into the hole below the cabin, where Kate would slit his throat. The body would then be buried in the garden behind the house during the night. Their downfall was the murder of a father and daughter with the last name Launcher, and the murder of Dr. William York, who had come looking for the missing pair. In the winter of 1872, Mr. Launcher and his daughter had left Independence for Iowa, but were never heard from again. In the spring of 1873, Dr. York took it upon himself to look for the Launchers, stopping at the homesteads along the trail to ask questions. Though he reached Fort Scott, Fort Scott unscathed and started to return to Independence on March 8th, he never reached home. Dr. York had two brothers, one living in Fort Scott and the other in Independence. Both knew of his travel plans, and when he failed to return home, an all-out search began for the missing doctor. Colonel York, leading a contingency of some 50 men, began questioning every traveler along the trail and stopping at the area homesteads. One of those places was the Bender Inn. The Benders tried to help by admitting that Dr. York did indeed stop at their place, but convinced the search party that he had left and was probably intercepted by Indians. Even with her clairvoyant abilities, Kate attempted to search for the missing doctor to throw any suspicion off of herself. After Colonel York's visit and the meeting at the Harmony Grove schoolhouse, the Bender family fled. Only a few days later is when the homestead was found abandoned and the search party began to discover the grisly remains of the bodies. The diggers were astounded to find what would become known as one of America's first mass murder burial grounds as body after body was uncovered. Ten bodies were found in the Bender's apple orchard, including Dr. York and the people he had been searching for, Mr. Launcher and his daughter, just seven or eight years old. More gruesomely, though the little girl's body was found to have multiple injuries, none of them would have caused her death, and trigger warning, it was speculated that she may have been buried alive. Following the discovery of her remains, the Kansas City Times reported, the little girl was probably eight years of age and had long sunny hair and some traces of beauty on a countenance that was not yet entirely disfigured by decay. One arm was broken, the breastbone had been driven in, the right knee had been wrenched from its socket, and the leg doubled up under the body. Nothing like this sickening series of crimes had ever been recorded in the whole history of this country. 
Other bodies found in the garden were those of Henry McKenzie's mutilated remains, three men by the names of Ben Brown, W. F. McCrady, and John Geary, as well as an unidentified male and female. Johnny Boyle's body was found in the well. Dismembered parts of several other victims were also discovered but can never be identified. Four other bodies were with crushed skulls and slit throats were also found outside the property in Drum Creek and on the surrounding prairie. For all of these deaths, the benders gained about $4,600, which is equivalent to $107,340 in today's money, two teams of horses and wagons, a pony, and a saddle. Because some of the travelers were carrying nothing of value, it was widely speculated that the benders killed simply for the thrill of it. As word of the grisly murder spread, more and more travelers came forward to tell their own stories of a narrow escape, including one gentleman named William Pickering, when he refused to sit with his back to the canvas because of its disgusting stains. Pickering said that Kate Bender threatened him with a knife, so he fled the premises. A Catholic priest said he fled when he saw one of the Bendermen concealing a large hammer. After following a fresh trail of wagon tracks, a search party found that the Benders had gone to the town of nearby Thayer, some 12 miles to the north. They purchased tickets on the northbound Leavenworth and Lawrence and Galveston train to Humboldt. Several days later, the Benders' team and wagon were found a short distance away and the horses had nearly starved to death. Upon further investigation, Captain James B. Ransom, the train's conductor, said that John Jr. and Kate disembarked at Chanute and took the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad train south to the Red River country near Denison, Texas, which was then the terminus of the railroad. Allegedly, the pair then fled to a tough outlaw colony along the border of Texas and New Mexico. Meanwhile, Pa and Ma Bender continued on the train north to Kansas City, where it was believed they transferred to a train headed to St. Louis. Attempts to capture the bloodthirsty family were immediately made by both law officers and vigilantes alike. Though no one ever collected the rewards offered, rumors of several parties who had captured and killed the Benders began to fly. One vigilante group claimed to have shot down the men and Ma Bender and burned Kate alive as the witch they believed her to be. Another group claimed they had caught the Benders while escaping to the south and lynched them before throwing their bodies into the river. Yet another group claimed to have killed the Benders during a gunfight and buried their bodies on the prairie. However, none of these tales were confirmed, nor were their bodies found, so most thought that the Benders had managed to escape. For years, sightings of Ma, Bender, and Kate were reported, and two women were eventually extradited from Michigan on this charge. On October 22, 1889, a trial got underway in the town of Niles, Michigan. A woman, Elmira Monroe, had accused her adult daughter, Sarah Eliza Davis, of larceny, specifically of having stolen a frying pan, some pewter plates, and a pair of infant stockings. The courtroom was packed as the trial began, a buzz with rumor and speculation crowded with curious onlookers, but hardly anyone was interested in the charges of theft. Most people there believed that Davis and Monroe were concealing a much more secretive past. As the trial unfolded, the courtroom and soon the nation had become convinced that finally, after almost two decades, Ma and Kate Bender had at last been found. The trial quickly became a media sensation. It seemed an easy out. Half of the Bender clan, it seemed, had simply fallen into the lap of law enforcement. All they had to do was bring them back to Kansas. But at a preliminary trial to determine their identities, the mystery only deepened. Of the 16 witnesses brought to the stand to identify Ma and Kate Bender, seven were positive that they were the Benders. Seven were equally positive that they were not, and the remaining two couldn't come to a definitive conclusion. Eventually, their defense lawyers were able to prove that Davis and her mother were definitely not the Benders. 
They were released, narrowly escaping an almost certain execution for crimes that they did not commit. Of the family, Pa Bender was found to have been a man named John Flickinger from either Germany or Holland. Though he allegedly committed suicide in 1884 in Lake Michigan, others believe that Ma and Kate murdered him because he had fled Cherryvale with all of the cash and valuables that they had taken from their victims. Ma Bender was born in the Adirondacks and married as a teenager to a man named George Griffith. After bearing him a dozen children, including Kate, Mr. Griffith suddenly died, some said of a bad place on his head resembling a dent that might be made with a hammer. Afterward, she reportedly remarried several times, killing those husbands and three of her older children so that they could not testify against her. John Jr. was found to have been a man named John Gebhardt. His habit of laughing aimlessly led him being described as a half-wit, though many afterwards believed this was simply a ruse to disguise his clever nature. Though most were led to believe John and Kate were sister and brother, others have said that they sometimes passed as man and wife, as the two were known to have had a relationship. A writer for an A&E True Crime blog stated, My personal feeling is that Kate and Ma were probably biological mother and daughter, and Kate and John Gebhardt were probably common-law married. People in the community describe them as having an intimacy that made them seem more like husband and wife than brother and sister. I think Pa is one of Ma's many previous husbands. It wasn't uncommon for women to be married a lot at the time, especially if they were working class. After the Benders escape, one detective who had closely followed all the leads said that he had traced John Jr. to the outlaw country along the Texas-New Mexico border, where he had found that the criminal had died of apoplexy, which is unconsciousness or incapacity resulting from cerebral hemorrhage or a stroke. Kate was the fifth child of Ma Bender and was born Eliza Griffith. Eventually, she married and went by the name Sarah Eliza Davis. Allegedly, while working at the Bender Inn, she earned her keep as a prostitute, adding an additional amount to the traveler's bill for the privilege of laying with her. In the end, it was Kate who was primarily blamed for the numerous bloody murders that, even at her young age, was the inspiration for the crimes. The a and True Crime blog writer also stated this about the group. The older couple seemed quite withdrawn. They probably lived hard lives and were not that interested in interacting with the community. Kate is the most compelling of the group, someone who wanted a life that she didn't have the means to attain or wasn't willing to work hard enough to attain it. Crime, for her, was an easy way to make money. John Gebhardt at first seems very pious, quiet, and kind of under Kate's control, but he turns out to be a glib person, a con artist. He uses his charm to win people over, initially, but isn't quite bothered to keep up appearances in the long run. You see that with Kate, too. Though the tales of what happened to the Benders can only be speculated as to their accuracy, the fact that ten bodies were found on the property is not disputed. Other corpses found in the area and the many mysterious disappearances of other lonely travelers led the locals to believe that the Benders killed more than 20 people. The sensational tales and rumors of the Benders continued well into the 20th century, but what happened to them remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Old West. They were never brought to justice or made to answer for or even explain their crimes. The Bender family left behind more questions than bodies. If the terrible story of the Bender murders was not legend enough, another tale began to circulate regarding the property upon which the Benders had once lived. The old Bender property was haunted, and the rumors of the locals began to fly. A a decade after the gruesome killings, nothing was left of the cabin and outbuildings of the property. The only thing remaining? An empty hole that had once been the cellar. From these depths allegedly came the souls of those murdered on the site, wandering about the property and making moaning sounds that passerby could hear. Those most often reporting glowing apparitions on the property 
were those who came to the site in search of some long-lost souvenir of the grisly murders. Quickly, the scavengers were frightened away by the dead souls to spread their ghostly tales. As the haunting legend continued, people began to say that Kate Bender had returned to the property, doomed to roam the very land where she had committed so many atrocities. Whether the stuff of folklore or fact, many believe that the trapped souls of these century-old ghosts continue to lurk at the site today. So provocative was the Bender family tale that the Bender Museum was created in Cherryville in 1961 in honor of the Kansas statewide centennial celebration, an exact replica of the Bender cabin was built that housed antiques and household items. In its first three days of opening, it attracted more than 2,000 visitors. In 1967, three of the Bender hammers were gifted to the museum by the Dick family. The museum remained a popular tourist destination until it closed in 1978 when the fire station was built. Though many wanted to relocate this building, it became a controversy in Cherryvale, with locals objecting to the town being known for the Bender atrocities. In the end, the artifacts, including the hammers, photos, and newspaper clippings, were placed in the Cherryvale Museum and can still be seen today at 215 East 4th Street. In addition to the museum, Southeast Kansas may be the only place where a state historical marker celebrates mass murder. While not actually on the old Bender property, the marker sits on the high prairie about a mile northwest of Bender Mounds at the U.S. 400 and U.S. 169 interchange at the Montgomery County Rest Area, north of Cherryvale. And that, my creepy friends, is the story of the Bender family. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I really found this very interesting. I think because I had never heard of it, and I very much enjoyed researching it. I hope you enjoyed it too. And if you have any suggestions, send them my way at darkcrossroadspodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe wherever you're listening to this and check out our social media to stay up to date. We will talk to you later. Don't forget to be weird, stay different, and don't trust anyone. Dark Crossroads Podcast is brought to you by Problem Wildlife. Problem Wildlife serves Western Massachusetts and has been humanely protecting your house and family from unwanted pests for over 20 years. Take back your space with an animal control service that you can trust. They are family owned, fully licensed, and are knowledgeable and dependable. To find out more about their services, simply visit their website at www.problemwildliferemoval.com. Again, that's www.problemwildliferemoval.com. And the website will also be included in our show notes.